And now I'd like to hand you over to Professor Martin White, who would kindly introduce our three panelists and be chairing the Q&A discussion session today. And um, over to you, Martin, and enjoy the panel discussion, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Erica. And uh, welcome to everybody who's joining us today. There are people joining all the time. We may not be quite at full capacity yet. Um, very delighted to um, be able to uh, host this session today on behalf of the MRC Epidemiology Unit. Um, this is a slight departure from our usual seminar uh, in which we have a long talk by one person and then some questions and discussion. Um, today, instead, we're going to have three short talks um, and a lot more time for discussion. We wanted to open up a debate about a really important um, present issue, both for research and for policy. Um, so the focus of this seminar is on policy making, and there is quite a lot of, um, in quotes, certainty in the academic literature about um, policy making and how it works. But this is frequently confounded by real life experience. Um, and uh, so we're not here today to provide definitive answers um, or a definitive account, but to explore some emerging science and to hear reflections from uh, a formal, former civil servant um, who was uh, deeply engaged in policy making in the Department of Health. Uh, and of course, from you, the audience as well. We want to hear your reactions, which is why we've allowed a lot of time for discussion. So I'm not going to prolong the introductions. We have three great speakers. Um, Dolly Tice is a PhD student uh, in the MRC Epidemiology Unit. Kelly Parsons is a postdoc researcher from the University of Hertfordshire. And Una O'Brien is a former, former civil servant and independent advisor on health policy. I'm going to give them slightly more extensive introductions when I come to each of them. Um, so those are our speakers. Um, uh, you've heard the introduction about uh, putting questions in the chat and so on. I do encourage you to do that. Um, so without further ado, we are going to go to Dolly's brief talk, her brief intervention to kick things off um, while she's getting her slides up. Um, I uh, would, just, uh, would like just to briefly introduce Dolly. Sorry, I just need to change my screen. Um, so Dolly's uh, completing a PhD in the MRC Epidemiology unit uh, in the University of Cambridge, um, supervised by myself and my colleague Dennis Gruber, who's in the um, Bennett Institute for Public Policy and the Department of Political Sciences. Her research examines what influences government policy making, how governments use and understand scientific research, and understanding the particular role of uh, the policy entrepreneur, and all of this with a focus in particular on obesity policy. So over to you, Dolly. 10 minutes for you to tell us a bit about your research and uh, the importance of understanding policymaking. Thank you so much, uh, Martin, and thank you so much for joining. And uh, I must confess, I was so excited by this <laughs> event that I, I don't know if my talk is 10 minutes long, so I'm gonna try and go through quickly and clearly, but do um, tell me if I'm running uh, over in any way, shape or form, but... Um, I wanted to uh, start off uh, this um, presentation with a kind of background that I get a lot of people uh, across academia, policy making itself in, in politics and government coming to me and saying, I don't actually feel like I know that much about policy. So people who are politically active, people who are even studying things that are deemed related, don't necessarily always feel confident that they know about policy, what policy is, you know, what that means, the policy making process behind it. And I, and I really find it frustrating that there is a kind of perception of it that only sort of certain people know about it, or you've got to know lots about it in order to be able to enter into the discussion. So instead of rushing into the research and findings, I wanted to kind of set the uh, context a bit. So I've actually got two questions for you all, and I really hope you can use the chat function and the discussion time that we have um, afterwards to explore these. But really, we should be stepping back and asking what is government policy? What counts as government policy? Um, and the second question is, what is the point? <laughs> What's the purpose of it? What do we expect to happen when government proposes a policy. So have a, a think about those two and, and please do start using stuff, using the chat uh, to explore these questions. 
Um, but for the research that I'm going to be uh, talking about today, we use two existing definitions, which, as you can see, so policy is defined as a course or general plan of action to be adopted by government, party or person. And it includes also statements of the government's position, intent or action. And this is important because it captures all of government policy, not just legislation, regulation, or whatever, but any statement of the government's proposed approach to tackling something, including what it proposes other sectors or people do to help solve a problem. Policy is essentially all the ideas government has about tackling a problem or an issue. So this is how we both distinguished and identified um, government strategies um, and uh, government policies, which are often terms used interchangeably along with lots of other terms, but it, we, we focused in on government strategies and policies. So government strategies are the overall documents uh, published and the policies are the individual ways government seeks to tackle an issue contained within them. So you'll often have a strategy with lots of different policies contained within them. Um, coming back to the second question I posed to you all, what is the point? What's the purpose of government policy? What do we expect from it? Is it about solving a problem? Is it about sending a political or ideological signal or message? Is it there, I, provoke, I pose this provocatively, to appear to be doing something just to stay in power? <laughs> or is it a bit of all of these? Um, and it's not really, if it's not really about solving a problem, but really about appearing to be doing something, then what does that mean for policymaking as a whole? Again, please use the chat function to explore these um, further. Now, why am I asking you these basic questions about policy? Well, firstly, it's because I think too often these are overlooked, including in the literature. And only when we really start thinking about these can we better scrutinize government policy. We need to be crystal clear to do that, um, to know what we think about it ourselves. What do we expect from it? What do we think it is? How do we think that government should be, should be uh, producing and publishing policy? And I know too many people, as I said, who don't feel like they can uh, enter into the space and, and, and easily and understand their role in scrutinizing that. So I want to kind of own the asking these more basic questions of what policy is and exploring that, challenging that. But I'm also asking this because if policy is proposed to solve a problem, then why hasn't the issue of obesity and poor diet been solved, given that we've had three decades of it? And this is what this question is what really drove our research into this, given we've had so many government policies, why hasn't it actually solved the problem and perhaps it's because of the other motivations uh, in terms of government policy. So to explore this issue, we analyze government policies using this analytical framework of uh, five themes. And I broadly, although I realize looking at it again, this is slightly more confusing than it was intended to be, but I broadly categorize these into two groups of the what's and the how's. So what policies have government produced and proposed over the last 30 years? And how have they proposed those? What are the implications of the way they've proposed them? And we base this on existing theories and existing frameworks and group them together because too often the literature has tended to look at one in particular part. So maybe just the likeliness of implementation or just the policy types. And this was all about bringing this together. And um, it's so important at this point to, to note, and I hope you listen to it when you hear radio interviews about policy, is that there tends to be a real focus on the what, you know, what ideas work, what policies should we be doing, and less on the how. So this research was also about rebalancing the debate um, between or the focus of this debate, not only about what policies should the government be proposing or should it not, uh, but also how, because you can have the best idea in the world but if it doesn't lead to implementation or action or evaluation or whatever, then we're still not going to see the change needed to tackle certain issues. So what did we find? Um, this year, 2021, marks 30 years of government obesity policy. It was in 1991 that the UK government first formally recognised its role in tackling obesity. And the following year, in 1992, the kind of first obesity policies were proposed, along with the obesity reduction targets. 
We have since had 13 additional strategies, so 14 strategies overall, and these have largely led to very little change. As you can see, you've got the um, lines for adults at the top uh, in terms of obesity and overweight prevalence, and children is the dotted line at the bottom. In terms of government, what government policies have been proposed, I will, I will go through these and if anyone wants more detail on these then I can come back to them in the, the discussion, but I've tried to aid your eyes towards the orange which are the largest proportions of the policies proposed, so we've had lots of institutional policies, things like setting up uh, Sport England, having a public health minister, that kind of institutional policy, lots of guidance and standards, professional development like the training of health professionals, and then lots of unsurprisingly, lots of information based campaigns like change for life or enable policies like uh, provision of uh, fruit and vegetables. Very little fiscal uh, disincentives, soft drinks industry levy, for example, and very little non-fiscal um, disincentives and incentives as well, and no elimination policies. So we haven't had anything that said we should just ban something altogether or stop the company from operating. Um, in terms of implementation viability, this was for me the most fascinating part of this whole research. So we set out this implementation criteria, seven pieces of information a policy needs to be proposed with in order for it to be very likely to actually lead to action, to be implemented. And the largest proportion of all policies were proposed without any of this information versus 8% of policies, just 8% that were proposed with all of the above. And if you go into some of the details, you can see when it comes to cost on budget, 91% of policies were proposed with no cost or budget, 76% with no monitoring or evaluation plan details in there, only half with a time frame, 19% with cited evidence upon which they're based, and the rest is not that um, optimistic either. Even the largest um, or the, the piece of information that most policies were proposed with, 71% with who is responsible for actually implementing it, even within that, sometimes we um, it would just state, you know, the Department of Health, for example. And I have to pose that question again to you all. Is that specific enough? There are so many people in the Department of Health who really is accountable to that. And how would you hold um, them to account? How would you know where to look of who is responsible within the broad remit of the Department of Health? When it came to the regulation approach, again, um, this is a, a, a pyramid, a regulation pyramid based on the work of Professor John Braithwaite, who is, produces brilliant work. I would um, encourage anyone fascinated also with regulation approaches to read his stuff. And this broadly is the approach that leads to an, uh, an increased chance of compliance, regardless of whether you're using legislation, whatever deterrence measures, it doesn't matter, or a voluntary approach. If you fulfill the bullet points in white, then you are likely to achieve high compliance. And what is recommended for that high compliance as well is that you escalate from the base up. So you don't start with a deterrence measure like legislation. You learn about an issue, you build the capacity to deal with it. And then you move to the green restorative approach, which is the assumption that if you say what needs to be done, people will do it, sectors will do it. And if still then you haven't had much action, then you start to move to deterrence measures and you use levers like fiscal levers or whatever regulation. And if then you're still not getting any um, action or response, then you move to incapacitation. And that's really when something is genuinely harmful and, and the government needs to stop it entirely. And as you can see, there were no policies within that. But we're still very much, even after 30 years, sitting a little too comfortably in the capacity building and restorative approach. And we're only just seeing increases towards the deterrence measures, realizing that the, the pace of change, the pace of meaningful action is just not fast enough. And what we have noticed that over time we're moving towards uh, or we're escalating up that, that uh, regulation pyramid. And then finally, in terms of the demands on individual agency, this is really about with each policy proposed by government, how much resource does an individual need to use in order for it to be effective and equitable? And again, I'm sorry, this is also not a tremendously clear, <laughs> slightly too much information in one table, but I will boil it down to you that the largest proportion were very high, highly agentic, which means that it demands a lot of individual resource and agency in order for the policy to be effective, which also means they're less likely to be equitable. The smallest proportion was structural, which are really about shaping the environment to make it easy for everyone. And that was the smallest proportion of policies. But again, 
the trend in terms of over the last 30 years has been moving much more towards more scru structural uh, policies. And in the most recent government strategies, they have contained higher proportions of structural policies. So positive notes is that we're moving in the right direction. Our summary uh, was we would give them four out of 10, uh, all the governments, uh, we weren't discriminatory, <laughs> all governments over the last 30 years, four out of 10 could have done better. And um, I wanted to briefly point out one particular problem, Change for Life, very familiar, I'm sure, to lots of you, a programme that has continued pretty consistently since 2009. Lots of money goes on uh, to spending it, but I dug a little deeper into the evaluation only to sadly find that what they evaluated was the sign up numbers rather than the health outcomes or whether it leads to any meaningful change. So I would say look at evaluations with caution. What are the implications for policy and practice? Well, I guess the question comes down to what I asked in the first place. What do we expect from government policy? How should government policy be proposed? It's not just about the what, you know, the ideas and the policies that government's proposing, but also the how. Should it propose it in a way that's likely to be implemented? I ask that slightly rhetorically, but um, we would probably want it to be <laughs> implemented. And this, I'm giving you an example from one of the strategies. It was probably the clearest set out of policies in a government strategy this is from 2005 in the Labour government and they at the very least they gave you who was responsible but again you can just see it's departments in most cases and when they were going to do it but they didn't have any of the other information uh, like uh, you know um, uh, the cost or budget or anything like that in these tables so should we be demanding clarity when it comes to the way that policies are proposed when they're published in terms of future possible research I mean, where do I um, stop to begin? There are so many you could go back and look at which policies were implemented and whether those were the ones that were proposed with more of the implementation criteria. That would be very interesting. You could also look back and scrutinize of the policies that were proposed with cited evidence. How high quality was that evidence? How was it the highest possible quality available evidence of, of that time? You could also look at who influences or who creates the government policies behind these. And that is exactly what I'm looking at now. I am building up the story of how one of those government strategies came about to understand how we end up with these types of documents that are, tend to be so light on the detail and, uh, and sadly very unlikely to lead to implementation. Although again, ending on a positive, we're seeing things move in a good direction on that and more policy implementation and evaluation is happening. So I hope, I don't know if I've stuck to time, but that's me done. Thank you, Dolly. You were a couple of minutes over time, but I'm feeling generous today. Um, uh, that's very helpful. We're not going to take questions straight away, but I see there are people raising issues and asking questions in the chat, which we're monitoring. Um, so thanks for that introduction, Dolly. Um, we're going to move now to uh, Kelly Parsons. Um, thanks very much for joining us, Kelly. Delighted to have you here. Um, Kelly's a food policy and governance research fellow at the University of Hertfordshire. She has a PhD in food policy and a master's in food policy and nutrition for the Centre for Food Policy at City University uh, in London. Uh, before becoming a researcher, Kelly worked in uh, food civil society, delivering ground level urban food system change, and also as a journalist, an investigative journalist, which I'm sure comes in handy. Um, her research is foc focuses on food system policies, policy-making processes, and governance structures at global, EU, national, and local levels. She's also an EU uh, commission-appointed expert and has acted as an advisor on several um, major food system research projects. So uh, thanks for joining us, Kelly, and uh, we're looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Over to you. Oh, sorry, hang on. We can see your slides and I can hear you. Can Oh, perfect. OK, good. Thank you very much for having me. And um, thank you for the invitation from MRC Epidemiology Unit to share some of my findings on um, food systems and policy making and a few ideas about what a food systems approach to policy making uh, might look like. So I'm starting off with this quote um, to answer the question, why does policy making matter to food systems? And this quote talks about the challenge 
uh, of needing to adjust policy and practice to better prioritize the environment and health and balance contrary policy initiatives. And it could have been lifted from any number of recent reports on food systems, um, including last week's National Food Strategy for England. But as a surprise, it's actually uh, over 20 years old, um, made by Professor Tim Lang in 1999. So one of the reasons this uh, challenge matters to me is because we're still having quite similar conversations uh, 20 years on. And the terminology varies. Uh, the current discourse is about a systems approach, but we also talk about joined up policy, policy integration, policy coherence. The fundamental challenge um, that they're all referring to remains um, broadly the same. So a brief refresher on that challenge. So on the one hand, we have a complex, interconnected, interdependent food system, which needs to be transformed because the way we produce and eat food is making us sick and destroying nature. And we know that policies are the control knobs for systems change. But the policies that influence the food system are multiple and fragmented across that system, which means they can lead to unintended consequences and incoherence between objectives across agriculture, climate, nutrition, and waste, for example. And at the same time, we have a policy-making system separated not just by those objectives, but also, um, and this is by design and for very sensible reasons, uh, by accountability, budget, evidence, and so on. And this isn't a problem that's unique to food by any means. Joined up government has been described as the philosopher's stone of modern government. Um, but because food's at the heart of so many major social challenges like obesity and climate change, which, we requ which require a whole of government approach, um, the challenge is particularly acute. So the research I've been doing has been interrogating how the food system works and how the policy making system works and trying to create some organizing frameworks to provide a shared view of where we are and how we might move forward. So one piece of research I've done looked at who makes the policies which influence food systems in systems language, where do the levers for change reside? So this map looks at the example of who makes food policy in England. And what it illustrates is that along with um, what we might consider the big four food departments circled here, um, there are many others, plus lots of agencies and bodies not shown here, which play a role. So the levers are dispersed and don't always sit where you might expect. Then I started digging down into this long-standing idea that we need more joined up food policy by trying to establish how joined up it actually was um, already and where connections were missing. And I devised a sort of screening method to identify where there were connections being made across government. And the examples shown here are some of the key ones that were identified. And actually um, what Kelly, you got on to mute. Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, where did I, did I mute recently or? Can you hear me? Sorry, on, only just, yeah. Okay, um, so uh, yeah, childhood obesity was one of the main um, issues which was seen to be uh, taking a cross-cutting approach involving multiple departments uh, beyond health, on paper at least. And I looked at where join up on food systems issues wasn't perceived to be happening. And these examples shown here are where there was sort of broadest agreement. And several of these feature in the national food strategy, which was launched last week. Um, the disconnects around trade, dietary guidelines and land use. And I've also drilled down further into one particular example, um, the food policy response to COVID to look at how Co what coordination happened around that one particular issue. Um, so you can see the departments around the outside, and then we can see that with all of these different interventions that were made, there was lots of coordination, particularly between DEFRA and other departments to make those interventions happen. And it shows that a lot of connecting was happening. But though there was, there was a lot of what we label routine coordination, the analysis suggests there were coordination failures in terms of prioritizing strategic objectives, particularly dietary health, in a number of the policy interventions were made, and I've given some examples here. Um, 
and a lack of explicit messaging in comparison to the sort of public health messaging around COVID which, and food, which was, um, which was done in other countries. And I'm sure if we took the example of how food policy prioritizes climate change, it would probably come to some similar con conclusions that it's not being connected into policies as an urgent strategic priority. And we, um, me and my colleague, David Barling, call this um, strategic coordination. So the final piece of the picture on how food policy works is about the processes and structures for connecting. So I looked at what other policy making arrangements used and what other options are possible. So I developed this taxonomy of mechanisms for connecting policy inspired by Metcalfe's policy co coordination scale. And it stretches from connecting via personal connections like um, personal connections and policy sign off at the bottom. So day to day kind of um, activities up to the top uh, ministerial um, type mechanisms like a minister for food or a dedicated body. And then you can use this uh, taxonomy as a yardstick to see that in England, mechanisms currently used are those down at the bottom here, um, which makes sense because we know that there's some significant governance gaps in the current approach around monitoring, short termism, missing that whole of government um, approach. And the National Food Strategy has uh, posed several mechanisms that could address um, some of these gaps. So what can we do to bridge the food system and the policy system? So these, I thought I would give some of my work in progress thinking, um, sort of seven ways to put a food systems approach to policy making into practice, based on the fact that I often get asked by policymakers, what exactly does this, this mean? What, what, what does a food systems approach mean? What should I do? So the first is to understand the food system itself and its interconnections. And I think there's very good progress being made um, on this uh, already. Then once we identify what needs to change, we need to think about who holds the levers and that might be one department or multiple departments. Then need to identify what policy solutions could be used and um, utilizing the broad toolbox of options of, of lots of different policies um, influencing food systems all over the world, um, much of which um, uh, doesn't get shared. So we don't really know what's happening um, across the, the globe and we don't really get a lot of policy lesson drawing um, which could benefit everybody. And also knowing whether those policies are effective or not. Uh, the little thumbnail here is a uh, a piece of work at mapping policy levers for food systems transformation, which will be published shortly by the UKRI Transforming UK Food Systems Programme. Um, and the other thing is, I think uh, some what work centres for food could really help to support this goal of recognising the, 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 the policy levers and um, which ones work, obviously. Uh, I think then we need to have start considering more about how different policies interact, where's one policy dampening another, so we have dietary guidelines in place but then we have advertising for healthy food, uh, where could the addition of complementary policies improve effectiveness, so we have a net zero agriculture programme but perhaps we need an agricultural extension service to ensure farmers implement that successfully, and then how we might package together measures uh, to, to make them more effective, like, for example, a, a whole school food policy. And another step, I think, is to understand individual policies in the system context. So understanding what bits of the food system a particular policy uh, relates to. Um, so this is a sort of heat map tool that I've been developing, uh, which can show which bits of the food system a particular policy is relevant for or could be relevant for. And then finally, we can start to assess the coherence of the policy interventions that are made with strategic goals, for example, health. And I think the National Food Strategy recommends this idea of having a reference diet and underpinning food policy interventions with that. And I think that's one um, way that that could be done. And then all of this is very likely to require some increased capacity within government to address food systems. Um, and I think that's going to require going further up the pyramid of food governance mechanisms than um, even the, the national food strategy has proposed. So that's what policy can do. I just wanted to finish with um, some ideas of what research can do um, to help policymakers uh, take this food systems approach. So some ideas here of where there are gaps, I think, around how to apply systems mapping to policy, coherence assessment and um, how impact assessments map onto the food system how policies interact and what packages work and um, what the governance arrangements are in different countries and cities and, and, and what other barriers and enable 
enablers of cross-cutting working. And broadly, that means shifting the along the policy analysis spectrum um, towards more analysis of policy rather than just for policy. That's it. Thanks very much, Kelly. Um, uh, really helpful talk. Uh, I think very usefully um, built on what Dolly had to say as well. Um, so I'm starting to see some questions in the chat and also some other useful inter interventions, um, uh, which uh, you can have a look at and uh, we'll come back to those later. Um, moving on then to our third intervention. Um, I'm delighted to welcome, um, sorry, uh, Damon O'Brien, who is a formal, former public servant in the UK Department of Health and the NHS. So from 2016 to 20, 2010 to 2016, she was the Department of Health's permanent secretary and uh, previously held a wide variety of senior strategy, policy and delivery roles in health and healthcare. Currently, she's on the Council of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and she serves on an advisory board for the Obesity Health Alliance's forthcoming Healthy Weight Strategy. So once again, delighted to have you here, Una, and uh, look forward to hearing your reflections on policymaking from a completely different perspective. Over to you. Thank you so much, Martin, and hello to everyone on the webinar. I must say that having heard the contributions from Dolly and, and Kelly, I only wish that I'd known both of you while I was in the Department of Health, because it would have been immensely valuable to have your insights in your research and you know I say all power to you in, in the work that you're doing. Uh, I'm not an academic so um, I haven't got any slides I'm just going to talk from my notes and I'm going to make a few observations about the if you like the machinery of government about people and politics but cheekily I'm going to uh, suggest some things that I feel could benefit from further research if, if I'm allowed. Um, so one of the things that I would say, uh, if we're really honest about the nature of the government institutions that we've got, is that we've effectively got analogue institutions for a digital age. We've got a setup that is trying desperately to catch up with the complexity uh, and the scale of modern problems. And a lot of the sort of things that go on currently are in, in effect workarounds from early 20th century institutions and um, we only have to look at for example the way work is organized in government we've got 23 ministerial departments 20 non-ministerial departments and this work around perhaps you know over 400 agencies and public bodies which you might say is an attempt by governments over the last 20 or 30 years to deal with the, the implementation problem how do we group work organize it and, uh, and see that things get implemented. And all of these agencies and public bodies really um, have come about at that scale since the reforms in the late 1980s. So we have um, a, a number of other challenges perhaps where, you know, that help us to understand some of the problems that, that Kelly and Dolly have highlighted. Um, one I would suggest um, is definitely worth looking into further is the way that legal powers are distributed between government departments. And these legal powers are built up over many decades of legislation which assign legal authority to the Secretary of State for Health or the Secretary of State for Justice or the Secretary of State for um, Department of Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. And it can often be the case that when you're trying to coordinate something that the legal powers are not aligned or that the authority does not enable the thing to get done that uh, needs to be done because the legal power isn't even there. Uh, another area that's very tricky is the way that financial responsibility is allocated to departments from the Treasury. It's a little known aspect of the way government works, but it's a very, very tight system of accounting officer responsibilities. When I was appointed permanent secretary at the Department of Health, literally the same day, I received a letter from the permanent secretary at the Treasury setting out a lengthy list of responsibilities that I had for a budget of £120 billion. It's extremely daunting, but it puts you on your metal then to focus 
the entire system for which you're responsible on how that money is being used. And it makes you quite cautious about the risk that you might put behind any spending. And that accounting officer system is now 70 years old. It's there for a reason. It means that we do have tight control over public spending, but it also is inflexible when we're trying to do things that are new or innovative. One of the outcomes of this arrangement, I would suggest, is that when it comes to coordination, the mechanisms to get anything done have to have authority and they have to have money. And in reality, if you look at many of the coordinating mechanisms, not just in obesity or food policy, you'll find that they lack um, one or both of those. They lack perhaps the authority of the power of the Secretary of State, and they lack the money of having a budget where the senior official is effectively an accounting officer for that budget. So these are real structural problems about the inheritance, if you like, of 20th century government that we haven't really begun to address adequately, in my view. The second thing I want to talk about is people and their capability. So many people you know, on the call will be aware that we've got a civil service that's about 450,000 people. And yet many of those individuals are in uh, operational delivery roles, working perhaps for DWP or working in the prison service, working in the, in the um, military, supporting the military services. So relatively few are actually working on policy at roughly around 25,000. And uh, an interesting innovation that's come about over the last decade, very much uh, led by uh, the late lamented Sir Jeremy Haywood, was the creation of professions within the civil service. This is quite a radical shift. Um, well, there used to be, of course, HR and finance professions everybody recognises. But now if you look at the modern civil service, there are a lot more professions. Um, policy profession is a named thing. It is an identifiable group that people can join. There is the digital profession and there is the operational delivery profession, which is the largest of all of them. So um, within the policy profession, they've set three very, very clear aims, which should be music to our ears. The better use of evidence, understanding the policy and political context and better planning and clarity on, on delivery. There are now standards for civil servants moving up through the policy profession. And it, there is a whole curriculum and qualifications that have grown up around this, including a master's programme in jointly between the civil service and the London School of Economics. But the question that I've brought six years after leaving the civil service is what difference is this actually making? And the reality is that we've got no idea uh, whether or not this effort um, to professionalize the policy work is um, being evaluated, how it's been assessed. There is no available information that I've been able to see. And I certainly think it is a big, big gap. A linked big gap in the curriculum, insofar as you can sort of view into it, is the attention that's put into helping civil servants gain a deep understanding of complex systems. So it's fine, and I welcome the proposals that Kelly is making about being able to map um, a system onto the, um, the various mechanisms that might be available. But I question the degree to which, even in the senior civil service, there is a sufficient breadth of understanding and insight into the nature of these complex systems so that they can achieve that mapping uh, sufficiently um, effectively. Um, it's not that they're not bright people, it's that the day job is very busy and the curriculum is focused on quite, you know, high level mechanistic skills rather than a, an understanding of real world problems. Now, a good model and something I do take some uh, confidence from is the creation, um, again, 10 or 12 years ago, of the um, Infrastructure and Projects Authority, um, which has carved out a capability in government around major infrastructure projects. And I'm talking here about HS2, I'm talking about things that involve buildings almost certainly. And this 
project uh, approach and the backup of something called the Major Projects Academy, I think has been a much more, um, a, a, how should I put it, a rigorous approach to getting work done in government and to dealing with the two issues of coordination and authority of people to get stuff done across boundaries. And critically, there is um, an important step on making the senior responsible owner of those projects directly accountable to Parliament and also giving them clout in uh, the deployment of their budget across government departments. So maybe some of the learning from the major projects um, work needs to be deployed in these so-called softer areas of, of system change. My third point, I'm trying to be quick here, is politics. I mean, it's a great thing that policy people are trying to understand politics and political context better, but what isn't clear is the extent to which politics are trying to understand government and how to get things done. I think too few MPs now are coming into Parliament with a background in local government, which used to be a really great training ground for dealing with communities and complexity and trade-offs in, in policy. And the learning lines and connections between new MPs and the civil service are few and very weak. And too often they only encounter each other in adversarial situations like select committees or the um, uh, particularly the Public Accounts Committee. On a, 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 an attempt to sort of deal with this, um, again, 10 or 12 years ago, was the establishment of the Institute for Government, which is very generously funded by the Sainsbury family, where there's some effort to build bridges between politicians and the civil service. And it does great work, but I really wonder whether it's found itself more in the think tank space than in the behind the scenes, uh, education, uh, support, coaching and enabling that's really needed between politicians and the understanding of, of government and how it works. Manifestos, political party manifestos are a problem. Uh, and far too often, <laughs> and I hope Dolly's research does get into this, they are pieced together at literally five minutes to midnight before they go to the printers. They are full of trade-off special interests and yet you sit inside a government department and wonder on some of the commitments, how on earth are we ever going to make sense of this or be able to implement it? And I really think if politicians, and I, many of them are my friends, want to make change that lasts, they really need to get a grip on their own manifesto making processes so that there are proposals that can systematically be, be taken on board. Time frames, four to five years, are a real difficulty in our system. And I don't think anyone has really cracked how we're going to deal with these long-term issues over numerous parliaments. Pensions reform has managed to achieve it. But right now on the table, we've got the ongoing public health crisis, obesity, um, climate change, and social care, just to name a few of these that are going to go across many, many parliaments. And we really do need politicians to come together in a much more structured way. So five points for research very quickly. One, coordination mechanisms. Do they work better in smaller jurisdictions? This might be an argument for um, greater devolution um, of power from government departments. Secondly, the impact of creating professions within the civil service. What exactly are the operating models that underlie the curriculum, curricula that are being used, and what paradigms and models of change are being deployed, and are they sufficiently adaptable to the real world? Thirdly, the manifesto process. I won't say anything more on that, but that would be fascinating to try and get inside and how to improve that. Uh, fourthly, what can we learn about when we do um, achieve change over a longer term time frame and what actually happened to enable us to make that happen. And then finally, my favorite one, and if anyone can get funding for this, it will be fabulous. Ethnography, uh, anthropologist and ethnographic study of the first uh, 12 months of a new ministerial team coming into a department after an election and actually being the fly on the wall throughout that year uh, to truly understand how the relationships build, how the dialogue happens, and what could be done to improve that, that 
that the first year when a new government comes into office from that deep inside, I think that would be a really fabulous piece of research. Thank you, Martin. Thanks very much, Una. Uh, you've given us a huge amount to think about. Um, so there have been uh, quite a lot of points made in the chat and one or two questions. Um, I would ask now that if anyone does have questions, you put them in the chat. Um, I'm going to um, I'm going to go first to um, Teresa Marteau, who has asked a question specifically of Una. I don't know, uh, can those who are controlling these things unmute Teresa so that she can ask her question? I can't actually see Teresa, so I don't know if this is happening. She's there and she's on, oh, she's there. I'm being unmuted. Thank you very much. Um, Una, fabulous uh, talk and uh, drawing upon your uh, much of your experience across government, um, uh, well, as a, as a senior civil servant and, and beyond. I just wondered if you could, in those um, summary points that you made, whether you could give an example of where you think there has been significant change over time and how you think that came about, because I was struck by those major challenges you mentioned, and I think you were calling for possibly cross-party support, which almost crudely implies removing the politics in order to get the change. So could you highlight any examples where you think we were successful and what you think some of the lessons might be? Many mm. thanks. Thanks, Teresa. Well, I think, um... I mean, I'm not suggesting that it's easy or any one set of actors just have to sort this out. But I think I can think of two examples where politicians have realised that they, um, well, the fundamental problem is that each government coming in, change of party, if it has a majority, can actually change the legislation of the previous one. I mean, that's democracy. That's why we you know, have a great country for what for all of its strengths and weaknesses. And it, it's a good thing that we can do that. But it also means that if you really have got a highly contested area, then it, as we can see with things like the structure of the health and care system, it's subject to this sort of wavering around of re, uh, reform just for ideological purposes, which is not very helpful. So two examples. One uh, is the... Uh, gradual and it does fit to one of Kelly's um, models, the, the way in which we have managed step by step to deal with smoking and tobacco, um, where I think governments have um, accepted the decisions of previous governments, although there were a few wobbles, I will say, in 2010, when the, the, the ch change to the coalition and big questions around whether to go ahead with plain packaging and so on, even though the regulations have already been made. Um, so, you know, it, it's not a shoe in that these things happen. And the second one is pensions reform, where the, all the parties have agreed to accept the new system of contributions to the, the um, single pension scheme. And that's a willingness to look at something over many decades. Dolly, I wondered whether you wanted to, to comment on successes and failures in obesity policy, because it, it, uh, you painted a slightly gloomy picture, obviously, but there have been some successes, and I wonder if you could just comment on those. It's so bad if that happens, because I keep reminding myself to be like, end on a positive note, <laughs> things are moving in the right direction. Um, so yeah, so I can cover those. I wanted to just come back to a couple of things that Una said. Um, one was on the unequal distribution of resources between departments, which is something I have found fascinating because I went to gov.uk, which is an amazing team of people who are so forward thinking, they're trialing and doing so much exciting stuff and trying to figure out how it is that certain publications like strategies can get published without this kind of key information to make it likely to be implemented. And one of the barriers, um, in addition to many of the familiar political barriers, which I'm sure you would have come across time and time again, 
but is the unequal distribution of resources. So you've got certain government teams with like one or two people there to make sure that that information is even just made available, let alone to a certain uh, degree quality or whatever, with some other departments that are much better resourced when it comes to just that team responsible for having information made available, put out there on gov.uk. So I just thought that was an important point to make that there are some you know, resource realities uh, unequal distribution between departments that um, that uh, should be recognised. And this links to the kind of policy success um, question. Um, but again, Una's point on manifestos um, ignited a thought, which is really from the research I'm doing now, which is also about how, and a question back to everyone um, watching, which is what do we expect from manifestos think tanks, any organization that is proposing policies, how do we expect them also, not just government, to propose policies? Should they really be doing the hard thinking about how it's actually going to happen? Or is that not their job? And I really do pose that because some people probably would sit saying, you know, a think tank's not got the resources to think about all of these different things or a charity or whatever. But then how do we propose policy recommendations that are actually also likely to lead to implementation? Because otherwise we're just gonna, as we know, lots of things get on dusty shelves. So we need to be realistic. And that's partly why I'm looking at drawing on one of the successes. I would say the original story behind the Childhood Obesity Plan, chapter one, which was published um, in 2016, which is what I'm looking at in detail at the moment, really is a success story. And I'm doing that research because it's about stepping back and going, OK, if we're going to improve this, how, do we, how does policy making actually work in reality? Unless you understand how it works in reality, then you can't understand where the um, improvements can be made um, realistically, because we have to be realistic. You sort of have to balance that what's ambitious but realistic. Um, and it's a fine art of recognizing where progress is being made, like it is we're moving towards, we might, be, might not be moving as fast enough, but we're moving in the right direction. But fine art of recognizing that, but not saying that's job done. And I feel like how do we con create conditions that um, are more positive in terms of facilitating meaningful policy action rather than just criticizing? Because again, even if my presentation where I tried to mention that things are <laughs> moving in the direction, sounds like I'm just criticizing. And again, it's very easy for me to do an analysis of 30 years of government policy and say, God, isn't government awful? But that's not that's not my personality type anyway. So really, instead, it's what can we be doing in research to facilitate the improvement and to help be a part of that, and um, including through our commentary, yeah. through our critique. So I would say childhood obesity original plan, but not necessarily how it got watered down. Thanks, Dolly. <clears throat> On the subject of um, uh, what makes good policy making, um, I, I wonder if I can ask Una to comment and then perhaps Kelly on the national food strategy because it's very topical, um, which does of course represent a slightly different model of, of policy making in that this was a, an independent or semi-independent report commissioned by government with some kind of commitment to bring forward a white paper in six months time. Um, and uh, which, which is a slightly different kind of way of policy making with some kind of upfront commitment. Um, now, uh, yeah, Henry Dimbleby obviously was perhaps a little taken aback when the first thing Boris Johnson said was, uh, well, we're not doing that in relation to the tax proposals. But uh, what, what do you think about this particular model of policy making? Well, uh, thanks, Martin. Just briefly, um, it, yes, it is a theme in modern policy making. This the idea of externalising the question, and uh, you, you know, we, we could sort of do a whole seminar on the um, the landscape of policy making, from you know, uh, the academic publications through to um, think tanks and so on. But this idea that the government asks a senior figure to look at a problem, um, we've, you know, going back 20 years, we saw the Wonders report, for example, into the future funding of health. I mean, it's quite a powerful thing because they do bring their own insights. I mean, that I know for a fact that Henry Dimbleby uh, was able to reach out to a much wider network because of who he is and um, his experience than a group of officials working alone on this. Um, he did have a lot of help from the civil service in producing it. I think it's an absolutely fantastic report. And it's so refreshing to actually have a report that faces up to the complexity and the long-term challenge. 
um, it's bitterly disappointing the way it effectively got sat on on the first day. But I think it, what that shows is that that it's hard for government to um, uh, where if you, when you've got a list of things that you want to get done in three years and someone you've asked to look at a problem comes back and says, um, there's a much bigger problem here you need to be dealing with. And by the way, you won't get it done in your own um, prime ministership. That's a, that's a little bit frustrating. So I do understand that. And I'm confident that that report will stand the test of time. And um, that people, when they really do study it, recognise that, that it has to be addressed. Sure, thanks. Um, and you've identified there one of the um, uh, one of the themes of uh, the the food strategy, the food, uh, national food strategy, um, has been public consultation. There's actually been a huge amount of public consultation that's yeah. gone into it, and that um, touches on something which uh, someone else in the audience has raised. Mark Pilling, I don't know if he's still with us, um, uh, suggested that. Um, um, the gov government's role is to enact man uh, manifesto pledges and reflect the priorities of the electorate. Um, so I, I just wonder um, if, if we could perhaps have some comment on that, the extent to which policy making can truly um, reflect manifesto pledges. Uh, Una, you've already uh, given some caveats about the, uh, the value of manifesto pledges, uh, but also importantly, the priorities of the electorate. Um, shall we go to uh, Kelly? Do you want to have a crack at this one first of all? Well, not not so much on manifesto pledges. Um, that's not really something I've looked at in terms of how um, what the relationship is between those and, and policies and, and citizens. But I guess for me, a couple of things that are interesting about the uh, national food strategy. One is that it has a different balance of objectives than most national food strategies or national food plans have had traditionally. So normally they're a kind of food plan for the food sector. And then we take in some of these other issues around food and bolt them on and kind of try and look across the board fairly at all of them. And I think what this one does is it very much uh, balance, rebalances the priorities towards health and the environment. Um, which I think is really valuable in terms of reshaping the problematization. Um, but whether that it delivers what people in government might have been expecting of it in terms of a food plan, given that traditionally they're thought of as these sort of food industry plans, um, may be problematic. And I guess the other thing is, is problem having that big focus on problematization when issues aren't in there, like around work in the food sector, jobs and the conditions that people work in the food sector, that's not really in that food strategy, then they may end up getting kind of lost in, in the discussion. So I guess that's one thing I would say about it. The other thing I would say is I think it's, it's, it's a very politically pragmatic and astute strategy, which is clearly picking uh, winnable battles, um, which, you know, and it's ambitious and it's bold, but in some ways it's very pragmatic. And I think that's, um, you know, will help it in this next phase of, of being kind of taken to the white paper and, and um, what might be winnable. Yes, I, I, think, I, think it's, I think it's impressive how much work seems to have gone into looking at the political acceptability, the public acceptability of each proposal. But also looking at things like the costs and so on and and whether things should be introduced as a pilot and evaluated rather than rolled out straight away so which addresses agree, quite, yeah. quite a lot of the um challenges of past policy making that dolly's identified una did you want to co comment on manifesto pledges and um uh, <laughs> well priorities of the electorate yeah i mean you know look let's it's important um uh, i mean i i set out in my career to be a politician and um, that was what I wanted to do until I came to the point that I realized that the problems were the problems were the problems. And um, I didn't want to spend my time fighting that way to solve the problems, but to focus on solving the problems. So that's what brought about the shift for me going into the civil service. The reason I mention that is that I do have deep respect for people who go into politics because that you know, virtually everyone I've ever met who's become a politician has done so because they see that as their way of contributing to society and making the country a better place. And um, our system has to work uh, in, in a way that brings together that, that process and that voice with an established capability in, in the civil service. 
So the more that um, as we move into this new decade with all the problems that we've got, that we can strengthen the dialogue between, not just between ministers and civil servants, but much more broadly than that. <coughs> so that when political parties are formulating their proposals, of course they're listening to the electorate and of course they're, they're um, inspired by an ideological potentially inheritance. But at the same time, they want to get stuff done. So I wish that we could have more ways to join the knowledge that's within the civil service with people who act in political parties so that we can have a better dialogue about making change happen. Mm -hmm. Because it's, it gets very reductive and then that brings about tension and frustration. People have made promises that are undeliverable and then they sort of complain that the civil service is hopeless but it's not necessarily like that sometimes the promises are just simply impractical unaffordable or undeliverable but I don't think that's an insuperable situation if we could have greater dialogue and you know I look to organizations like the IFG and maybe you know units there are a number of units within um, Cambridge University I think that are doing things to try and reach out and bring people together um, and a much earlier stage than happens at the moment. Thanks, Una. That's very helpful. Um, that touches on um, a number of points that have been made by Fiona Quigley, who is out there somewhere. Uh, again, I can't see you. Um, uh, one of the questions she asked earlier on, uh, as well as making several other comments, was uh, uh, about whether or not government um, should uh, consult stakeholders on policy design specifically. Um, Fiona, can, can someone unmute Fiona so that she can maybe ask a bit more specific question, if you wish? Hello. Hello. Hiya. Yeah, so I'm just thinking, um, I'm based in Northern Ireland, and obviously we have a different policy context. It's a smaller population. So in some of our more recent policies, um, we've done a lot of pre-engagement with, say, advocacy groups, both patients and professionals, and it seems to have made a kind of more robust, different type of policy implementation cycle. So I was just wondering, is that kind of missing from things like obesity policy, or is it more difficult in a larger population? That was just what I was wondering. Who would like to have a crack at that? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, hi Fiona, and it's great to hear um, from Northern Ireland, having just spent nearly three years working there, I really um, enjoyed my time there. I, I just want to say, to cause it, you know, it is the um, essence of good policy making to engage with people who are going to be affected by the change. And this happens all too infrequently, certainly in the civil service, as far as England's concerned. It takes time. It's complicated to do. I've seen it done very well indeed. And my best example are aspects of the 2014 Care Act, which consolidated a huge amount of um, former social care legislation into um, a, a much better system. And that was built on numerous um, citizens' assemblies that were held around England by Ipsos Mori organising for the department. It's an incredibly powerful process to bring uh, people together at, through one day discussion groups to try and um, hear from people affected by the change what they were prepared to give up and uh, what they were prepared to compromise on. And that all fed into the, the legislation of the 2014 Care Act. So it can be done. It's complicated, it takes time, and also it's, it's a very frustrating for a politician who will say, well, I've just been out there with the electorate and I know what they want, so you're asking me to spend half a million pounds on consulting them, really? So it does take a bit of effort to persuade them it's worth it. Okay, thank you. Thank, thanks, Una, and thanks, Fiona. Um, there have been a few points raised in the chat um, that are about um, uh, I suppose to put it put it um, simply, the the uh, the complex system problem that um, Una referred to. Um, so, um, so I'm just scrolling through here. Um, uh, earlier on, um, 
who was it? Sorry, so, uh, Owen, Owen Garling, I think it is, um, uh, asked about the application of systems thinking and, and looking at levers for change in, in, in policy development. Uh, more recently, I think uh, Dermot Hurley has um, made the point that we need to focus on more fundamental issues. I think this is the point you're making, Dermot, um, re removing the root causes of the problem. Um, and uh, of course, Kelly, you've touched on the, the systems, uh, complex systems nature of, of, uh, of, of the problems that we're trying to address with policy. Could we perhaps have some comments on the extent to which we can address uh, such huge root problems through policy? And I think, again, you know, the, the National Food Strategy, which came out last week, is a, uh, uh, and it, I think for me, one of the first examples of a policy framework that's been put forward that really puts up front the complex system challenges. Um, I suppose my question to you, Uno, would be, um, will, will policymakers get this? Will they be able to deal with that high level stuff? Um, and uh, perhaps same question to Kelly as well. Yeah. Una, do you well, want to go first? I won't say much on this. I mean, all I can say is I really, really hope so. Because, you know, um, but, you know, through the work, for example, that Kelly's doing and the doll is doing, getting their work published, making it visible uh, to, for example, um, the curriculum on the, on the civil service um, file stream, making it visible to the curriculum on the policy profession, reaching into those places, um, offering yourselves as visiting speakers on the, um, that joint master's program for the, the senior civil service high flyers at the London School of Economics. This is the way you're going to start to influence the, the thinking. Um, Cambridge University perhaps coming up with a master's of policy makers in systems thinking. Maybe there's one there already. You know, we, we, we can be active in, in this space. I think civil servants want to do the right thing. Um, they need encouragement and support to think more broadly. Yeah, uh, when, you know, you're you might be dealing with some car crash of an issue to do with an individual um, problem that's arisen. And yet at the same time, you're being asked to do this big system thinking. So they want to try and understand how to organize work to do that effectively. Yeah. What do you think, Dolly? Yeah, I just want to, because you've so touched on exactly what I, my immediate response to Martin's question and point there was, about, you know, is that the right way to think about it? I.e. the question being, should our policymakers going to get this? Well, you know, how will they understand it? Is it actually our duty as well to make sure that we communicate things in a way that make, makes them understand in a re realistic way in which they operate? Because again, the research I'm looking at at the moment is even a two page briefing can be too much with time poor policymakers. Again, Una, you will be so familiar with this. So how can we communicate things? I think the whole framing agenda is so exciting because if we know that there are competing priorities, I mean, just look at the trade deals happening and the competing priorities with the food system that's massively touched upon in the National Food Strategy and Kelly's work. And that, if you can unlock the barriers in people's minds through a reframing. Obviously, it's not the only thing that's going to be unlocking it, and they're very real structural and institutional barriers to that, but it's one potentially very powerful way to unlock people's understandings of why it matters to them, because there is such a common theme in my research about certain departments just not thinking health is their problem, or food is their problem, or whatever, even when it is totally connected. So that kind of uh, use of framing the responsibility of academics and researchers to communicate way more effectively and us to not see communication as an afterthought, but intrinsically linked from the very, very earliest stages of our research. But um, I'll leave it at that. Anything you want to add on this, uh, Kelly? Yes, just really to agree with this idea that, you know, yes, I think policymakers can get this high level stuff, but not if we just say we need a systems approach and you need to do joined up stuff. Yeah. You know, I think that is that falls into what Catherine Oliver calls the sort of do better school of knowledge transfer. And that's just <laughs> yes. not good enough. And um, so I think it's incumbent on anybody who's doing policy analysis or advising or recommending to be thinking about, you know, thinking about the systems themselves, thinking about who in policy relates to those bits of the system. And so where are they recommending changes? If you want to make this particular recommendation for a change, you say who you think 
based on what you know about who, who does what, who you think needs to be at the table there. Um, of course, in order to do that, we need transparency on what's happening. One of the, um, I think, unintended consequences of the sort of gov.uk approach to um, as a window onto government is that it's really good if you want to find out where to get your driving license renewed but when you want to get a picture of a particular policy issue who's involved in it what's been done before what's the live policy not what's just been hanging around for five years and nothing's happening on it that's very difficult so I think we also need some more detail on what's actually going on and I think the national food strategy with its approach to mapping and monitoring and reporting back on progress could really help to open up that window and, and, and help, you know, there to be more dialogue between those outside and those inside government is my view. Great, thanks very much. Uh, just had a whole bunch of stuff go in the chat. So I'm just gonna have a quick look at that. Um, okay, I'm getting through it, Harry. <laughs> Yeah, I think you, uh, Harry, you made some made some uh, made some very cogent points. Out, I'll, I'll leave other people to everyone to to read those. Um, uh, really about the uh, the challenges of um, complexity uh, with with politics and politicians. Um, unless you ha you want to ask a specific question, Harry, can someone unmute Harry Rutter? Uh, hi, Martin. Uh, thanks. No, I didn't really want to bother people with a question, but I, I, I guess this whole point about timescales is mm -hmm. something that we've, I, I think, generally lost sight of. Um, uh, time is incredibly important and uh, I think often ignored. We endlessly focus on the proximate uh, without thinking through properly how we achieve things that unavoidably are going to take longer than one or two or even three political cycles. Yeah. And uh, as you know, Martin, you and I have <laughs> talked about this many times, uh, this is also a problem in the research world where I think research systems and structures push us to look for short-term um, outcomes. Uh, but unless and until we seriously get to grips with time, I think we're uh, long-term and, um, and the, the time dimension of all this stuff, I think we're going to continue to tinker at the margins. Yeah, I think that's a, a, a great point, Harry. I, I mean, I, again... Can I just say on the... Yeah, point because it's also not just about election cycles which is the frightening insight into some of the research I'm doing at the moment it's also on leadership changes the fact that we've had a conservative government since 2015 and yet each leadership change has led to a disruption of the progress regarding obesity policy shows that we need to even think about it beyond that there are barriers within that and the most recent obesity strategy you know was published by the same party in government and yet it contained exactly the same policies essentially as the three strategies <laughs> published by yeah. the same government before so we even need on the time front absolutely and ways that we can quick quicken the pace when a new leader uh, not just a new government comes in yeah i mean i thought that there was a thought that went through my mind when dolly was presenting that actually um i know this is going to sound like an upside down way of looking at it but it is a good thing that all of those policies kept being put back on the agenda. I mean, inside the department is a small group of incredibly passionate civil servants on this subject. And it's almost, I see from that big piece of paper that they're not giving up, you know, so that's the other way of looking at it. But there is a real problem, even within political parties. I've been shocked both um, when working with Labour politicians and Conservative, to um, encounter their disagreement with each other about what they think the priority should be. So when one replaces another in a reshuffle, they go, oh no, we're not doing this, that or the other that their predecessor under the same government agreed to. This is very disorientating for the civil service, um, not because you don't want to be attuned to politicians, but more that you think once you've got a government, you've got a fairly predictable umbrella that you're working with under. 
So I come back to, you know, my central thing, if I had to choose one thing, we need more work with politicians earlier in their career to understand how to make change happen in modern government. And I think that, that that's, the, that's the work that I feel is very important to help to shift this. That's a great thought, Una, and I think a great thought to finish on as well. We have just gone slightly over time, so I'm going to now wrap things up. I'd like to firstly thank our three speakers for your excellent contributions um, and uh, answers to questions. Um, it's been a great discussion. Uh, thanks also to members of the audience who uh, posed questions or put uh, great thoughts into the chat. It's been uh, very, very interesting to see everything that you say. We will save the chat and um, we are recording this and we'll make it available afterwards. I'm going to hand over to someone, I'm not quite sure who now, who will uh, just give a few final closing remarks about future seminars and things like that. So thanks very much to everyone. Rich, I think. Yes, thanks, Martin. Yeah. Um, so I'd just like to thank Professor Martin White for his um, excellent chairing of this afternoon's session. Just to remind everyone, if anyone missed any of today's um, talk or wants to revisit any of it, it has been recorded and will be on the MRC Epidemiology Unit uh, website within the next few weeks. Um, again, thanks everyone for their attendance and I would like to wish everyone a brilliant rest of the day and don't get too warm. Thanks everyone.